Powell's predecessors, Adlai Stevenson, showed very clear photographs of a ship carrying Soviet rockets to Cuba. I have to say that my colleagues and I, on reflection, felt that today's pictures carried no such authority. Colin Powell is no Adlai Stevenson. <laughs> Fisk's report from the Security Council comes to an end. <laughs> it's a long way to New York by road, I discovered today. But the thrust of all this, the thrust of the whole message today from Secretary Powell, the narrative line, again, as always, revolved around one thing, September the 11th. Ladies and gentlemen, September the 11th, 2001, did not change the world. I tell my colleagues all the time, please stop printing and broadcasting those words. Over and over after September the 11th, this has become one of the outstanding, dangerous lies that we journalists have been propagating. September the 11th may have given President George W. Bush an excuse to change the world, but that, I believe, should be exposed for what it is, a manipulation of grief and fear in order to start a war that has nothing to do with the international crimes against humanity which took place in New York, Pennsylvania, and Washington just 2001, uh, just a year and four months ago. And it is a war that is being planned against a country, yes, led by a monster that has absolutely nothing to do with those atrocities. On September 12th last year, following my normal pattern, I went to the United Nations General Assembly to watch Mr. Bush. You know, when you see statesmen and political figures on television, there's a kind of flatness. The screen accommodates what they do and makes it somehow more amorphous with one's own existence. When you see them in the flesh, it's very different. I was quite frightened watching Bush on September 12th last year. Anyway, I sat in the General Assembly, and he started what I fear is an American attempt to reshape the Middle East, to rewrite the history of a region which is white-hot with anger at the United States. It will, I suspect, be the most frightening attempt to change the map of the Middle East since Britain and France, victors over the Ottoman Empire, divided up the spoils of the 1914-1918 war. We heard Mr. Bush's increasingly violent demands for an attack on Iraq and regime change elsewhere in the region. And be sure when it starts, and it already is beginning, our television broadcasters will use their familiar lines at the bottom of the screen, war on terror. In the days and weeks that followed September the 11th, 2001, I became increasingly disturbed by the vapid, hopeless, gutless, unchallenging journalism which passed for coverage in the Western media. The terrifying events of September 11th were mutated into a kind of movie. America at war, war on terrorism, war on terror, often these titles would appear in a kind of laminated gold typeface on the screen, the kind that once appeared in American biblical epics like Ben-Hur, <laughs> my old friend Charlton Heston. And each, and each newscast would be introduced with an orchestral theme tune, a TV jingle to bring you back from the coffee to watch the next episode of the war. I felt that this obscured realities, just as I also feared it dishonored the dead of September the 11th. And just as in the 1991 Gulf War, when we were treated to the hapless pictures of journalists wearing army costumes, so CNN's man at Kandahar in 2001 was among the first to put on a marine helmet. I, I must say, back in 1991, I remember all these soldiers, um, we thought they were, they were journalists coming in from America in their costumes. One journalist turned up with camouflaged boots, and he uh, painted on the boots were leaves. Now, those of you who've seen a desert or been in a desert <laughs> will be aware. Will be <coughs> I actually wrote about the helmet on the CNN man's head in Kandahar, and CNN replied that the UN, US Marines had insisted that their reporter wear a helmet. This is no excuse. Journalists have no business obeying military orders that make them look like combatants. And when so many of our colleagues accept these orders, as they did in the 1991 Gulf War, or when they turn up with a pistol in Jalalabad in October and November of 2001, this I'm talking about Haraldo Rivera of Fox News, <laughs> claiming they want to shoot Osama bin Laden, is it any wonder that we journalists become targets of attack? We lost 11 of our colleagues in Afghanistan. But my talk to you tonight is not about the dangers to journalists. It's about the dangers now posed for journalism itself, the facile, unquestioning acceptance of authority and of the trite and bland and deeply misleading government statements which are parroted and then blended into titles and headlines. 
From the very start, I predicted in my newspaper, The Independent, that this was not a war on terror, but a war against America's enemies, and most probably, Israel's enemies, which is what it is turning out to be. Yet we went along. Indeed, we still go along, despite all the evidence, in calling this a war on terror, a war for democracy, a war against evil. Newsweek last year, certainly the New York edition, carried a front-page headline which read, The Evil One. You know who that was, of course. But not content with allowing governments, you see, to become TV headline writers, journalists were now using biblical authority for their stories. We, the West, democracy, the forces of good, we were the ones that suffered, of course. And all over the anniversary last year of September 11th, and be sure this year too, we will have to suffer again. But of course, when the anniversary of the bombardment of Afghanistan fell due in the late autumn of last year, did we carry long and moving accounts of the thousands of innocent Afghans we killed? Did we help? Let me first ask you one question. When did we first hear of the Iraqi dimension of September the 11th, the one that we were hearing so loudly today, cymbals and drums in the Security Council? When did we first suggest that Saddam was in the picture? Did anyone say back then, September 11, 2001, in the days and weeks and months that followed, that did anyone say after these crimes against humanity then that Iraq would be in the firing line? I don't remember anyone saying that, and nor do you, I think. Where exactly did the slippage come? At what point did Osama bin Laden fade away to be replaced by Saddam Hussein? Our journalists, who should have picked up this, this up at once, were silent far from doing their job alerting readers and viewers to this astonishing transition in US foreign and military policy. They went along with it. The Times and the Post suddenly began to run long stories on the supposed intelligence links, of course they started then, between Iraq and bin Laden. Eight stories in one week, I recall, each sourced to administration officials, intelligence officials, diplomats in Washington and London, all of them, of course, anonymous. I've just been doing a story myself in my own paper, The Independent, it would have been about 21st of January that the Times' Eric Schmidt wrote about a story about America's decision to confront countries that sponsor terror. Here are his sources. Each one is in quotation marks. The story wasn't very long, but just listen to the sources. Senior defense officials, administration officials, some American intelligence officials, the officials, officials, <laughs> the officials again, administration officials again, terrorist experts and defense officials. Is that journalism? Whew. You see, when it comes down to it, you find that we newspaper journalists just play along with anyone. Last September of last year, just before actually I came over to the States for the anniversary, the British newspaper, The Daily Express, not my favorite paper, carried this headline, nuclear attack in just months. A bit late now, of course, the nuclear attack hasn't happened. Was this going to be Piccadilly Circus? Downing Street? Tony Blair, perhaps? You know, it's extraordinary what newspapers will print and what people will believe. What does a journalist do about this? Well, I don't work for them. The problem is, you see, that over and over again, we, it obscures realities. Today, we are prepared to discuss the wisdom, or perhaps we've gone beyond that, of starting yet another war in the Middle East. There is, after all, a fairly bloody war already going on, if we want one. But we remain quiescent. We do not investigate just how target Kabul became target Baghdad and in the coming days perhaps target Damascus or target Beirut or even since the Rand Corporation's pro-Israeli um, lecturer referred to the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia as the kernel of evil, perhaps target Riyadh. Even when our own dear Prime Minister Blair returns from the United States telling us that there may be a blood price that has to be paid in the event of war, not a single journalist points out that this will be a blood price principally paid by the Iraqis, not by us. Or if it is paid by young men, for example, from Manchester or Wolverhampton in England, it won't touch the family that lives in Downing Street. Richard Armitage, one of Colin Powell's, Colin Powell's deputies in Washington, announced a few weeks ago that the Lebanese Hezbollah, quote, may be the A-team of terrorism. Al-Qaeda presumably having been relegated to the third division now. <laughs> Armitage said that the Hezbollah owed America, here we go again, a blood debt. But where does this word fit into the language of these men? Note how yet again we're on the move. First, the heart of darkness beats in a man with a beard who has a propensity to live in Afghan caves. 
Then he transmogrifies into a rather less-looking guy, a resident of Baghdad with a liking for military uniforms, old British ones, I suspect, and a horrible moustache. <laughs> and then now out of the blue, it's the Levant, the Mediterranean, my home, Beirut, we should be targeting. Now, Armitage's blood debt uh, is presumably a reference to the killing of 241 U.S. Marines in the American base at Beirut on the 23rd of October, 1983. But, of course, he doesn't say so. Very few reporters have tried to winkle out what all this means. I should say, by the way, that the, I, when I asked this question at a university in New York uh, in December, you know, where did bin Laden get faded out and Saddam came in? He sat down afterwards, he wrote me a letter later and told me he sat down afterwards with his giant computer and fed in Iraq, bin Laden, uh, Afghanistan, Saddam, and went through the entire Washington Post, LA Times, and uh, the Times New York. And he came up with something quite extraordinary. It appears that in a period of just two to three weeks, the references to bin Laden al-Qaeda went down from about 50 to 500 to 30. And the references to Saddam went up from about 20 to 400. And the intervening period was the Enron scandal. <laughs> of course, there may be absolutely nothing to do with this. To its great credit, I should say that The Nation magazine in New York published on September 2nd last year a first-class article detailing the number of U.S. administration officials who have previously worked for pro-Israeli lobby groups in Washington or who still do. This at least might explain why the Bush administration now appears set to redraw the map of the Middle East along lines which Israel can scarcely dream of. No mention of all this, of course, in the television and media mainstream, in quotation marks, in the United States and largely, I'm afraid, in Britain either. Yet still, our blindness goes on. Immediately after the 1991 Gulf War, when it was clear that the awful Saddam would, appear, would remain in power, the United States government suddenly stopped making any reference to the Iraqi president. Sound familiar? No more Saddam. I remember how Colin Powell told a press, the general, General Colin Powell then, told a press conference I attended in northern Kurdish Iraq that the American government was talking to, quote, Iraqi officials but he made no mention anymore of the Hitler of Baghdad. I asked him what had happened to the Saddam fact. Hadn't he told us that Hitler was in Baghdad? Why no more references to the man who had been bestialized, and not without good reason, a few weeks before? And Powell just shrugged his shoulders and went on talking about Iraqi officials. The word Saddam had become banned. When did you last hear President Bush use the words Osama bin Laden? Not for some months. Then it was Saddam. Of course, Saddam now has to be brought back, or was recently. Later, be sure, Osama will be brought back if he doesn't bring himself back before that. You see, the real problem here, I think, is that we have begun to use constantly and accept the language of officials and governments. Note how almost every journalistic reference to al-Qaeda now talks about how US forces in Afghanistan are mopping up, wait for it, al-Qaeda, quote, remnants. This, by the way, means quote, so me adding words. The word remnants began to be used at a U.S. press briefing in Afghanistan and has now effortlessly and without any self-questioning entered into the journalistic lexicon. We are always closing in on hunting down, chasing, liquidating, cornering, arresting these elusive remnants. True, when U.S. forces tried to ambush them in the Shaikot Valley last year, the remnants turned out to be around brigade strength. And true, the attempted assassination of Hamid Karzai and the car bomb in Kabul last year, which killed 26 people, um, suggests there are rather more remnants than we expected. Now we have almost nightly attacks on U.S. forces who've withdrawn from at least on December 11th from one major outpost on the border. They were coming under fire every night from phosphorus rockets. They left it. Three days later, al-Qaeda came in and burned it to the ground. It wasn't great headlines there. Wall Street Journal carried a report on it, to be fair, but that was about it. Problems in Afghanistan, big problems still. Now the drug barons are back in control. Read the UN's warnings about the massive new narcotics traffic that is due to restart when this year's poppy crop is in. And we can't even bother to investigate the mass graves of northern Afghanistan in which our war criminal allies buried well over a thousand of their Taliban enemies. So let's talk about Iraq again since we seem to be about to invade it. You know, Back in October 10th of last year, the New York Times, uh, I don't want to burden you with this, but I'm going to have to, carried a report about what was going to happen after the invasion. It's changed its tune now, though it didn't 
tell us that, you know, the tune had changed. But this is the story. The White House is developing a detailed plan modeled on the post-1945 